Boomtown Reloaded is a competitive card game where two players will fight over the control of a town in the Weird West. Each player plays as one of six factions vying for power, the earnest deputies of the Law Dogs, the thieving bandits of the Sloan Gang, the eccentric mad scientists of Morgan Cattle Company, the hex-wielding clowns of the Fourth Ring, the manipulative thieves of the 108, or the stoic shamans of the Eagle Wardens. Players will build 52 card decks, consisting of dudes, deeds, actions, and goods. In this video, we'll teach you how to play Doomtown Reloaded by using the Law Dog and Fourth Ring decks you can find on the Pine Box Entertainment website. Each card in your deck has a suit, clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades, and a numeric value. These are used when creating poker hands during the game, but may be referenced at other times. A card's value ranges from 1 to 13. Ace counts as a 1, while jacks, queens, and kings count as 11, 12, and 13 respectively. During the game, you'll have a play hand of cards that you can use. In addition, at various times, you'll have a draw hand, which is used during a shootout as well as during the gambling phase. A draw hand is used for its poker hand ranks. Be careful never to mix up or switch cards from your play hands when you draw. Draw hands are considered either legal or illegal. The latter is known as cheating. A draw hand is legal if it does not contain any cards other than jokers that share the same suit and value. A draw hand is cheating if there's at least two cards in it, other than jokers, that share the same suit and value. After a player reveals a cheat and draw hand, other players will have the opportunity to resolve a cheat and resolution or other effects. Next, we'll talk about booting cards. Many times when a card's ability is used, the card tells you to boot it. You boot a card by turning it sideways by 90 degrees. A booted card cannot be booted again until it has been unbooted, which means turned straight up. Cards come into play unbooted. Booted cards cannot use an ability that has booting as a cost. In other words, if a card's ability says something like noon boot to do something, or boot a card to do this thing, you cannot do this thing if the card is already booted. Here we'll discuss the different types of cards you'll play in Doomtown Reloaded. First, the outfit card represents the home of your gang. Dudes will come into play here when you purchase them and is commonly referred to as the home for card effects. You will see the outfit's name, faction symbol, text box that describes the special abilities or traits that it has, starting stash, which is how much ghost rock you start the game with, and its production, which is how much ghost rock it makes for you each upkeep phase. Dudes are the characters that you will bring into play to help you achieve your victory of controlling the town. Dudes are always represented by the spade symbol. You can find their name, value, bullet rating, which determines how strong they are in a shootout, influence, which will help you take control of deeds and not lose the game, their faction symbol, text box, cost, which is how much ghost rock you must pay to bring them into play, and upkeep, which is how much ghost rock you must spend every upkeep phase to keep this dude in play. Deeds are the locations around town that will help you win the game as well as produce ghost rock for you. Deeds are always represented by the diamond symbol. They have a name, value, control value, which you will need to win the game, text box, cost, and production. Goods are cards that you can attach to you or your opponent's dudes to give some kind of benefit or penalty. They are represented by the heart symbol. They have a name, value, bullet bonus, which improves the bullets of the dude using the good, influence bonus, which improves the influence of the dude using the good, text box, and cost. Spells are cards that attach to dudes that represent their magical powers. There are three types of spells, and they can only be attached to dudes with the appropriate traits. A hex can only be used by a huckster, a miracle can only be used by a blessed, and spirits are used by shamans. Spells are represented by the heart symbol. They also have a name, value, text box, and cost. Action cards represent special events plans, and tactics that you can use to give yourself an advantage in many different situations. Actions are represented by the club symbol. They have a name, value, text box, and cost. Jokers are special cards that you can only have two of in your deck, one red and one black. These cards are wild cards and can become the suit and value of your choice when they're used for pull or draw hands. You cannot play one from your hand, also, Joker cards cannot make a hand illegal. 
During a game of Doomtown Reloaded, you will be the owner and controller of many different cards. The owner of a card is the person whose deck a card came from. The owner of a card never changes. The controller of a card is a person who gets to make all decisions about that card. Whenever a card refers to you, it is referring to the controller of that card. Most of the time, the controller is also the owner. However, there are two times when this is not the case. 1. When someone uses an ability that uses the word take control, that means the other person takes control over your card. 2. The much more common method concerns deeds. Whoever has the most influence at a given deed controls that deed. A deed's controller can change any number of times per day. This does not move, boot, or otherwise affect the deed. If there is a tie for the most influence, and even 0-0, zero, zero, because no one is there, the owner has control, even if the owner is not part of the tie. If you control a deed or dude, you also control all the cards attached to that dude or deed, whether or not you own any of those cards. No one ever owns or controls the town square. Players always own and control their own home. The influence rule does not apply, because an outfit card is not a deed. At the start of the game, place your outfit card face up on your side of the table. It is your home location and your first location on your street. Take Ghost Rock from the bank equal to your outfit stash. Once players have revealed their outfits, each player searches their deck for up to 5 dudes with a combined cost less than or equal to their starting stash. These dudes could only be dudes from your outfit or drifters. You cannot have dudes from another player's outfit in play at the start of the game. You can also only include one dude with the grifter keyword in your starting gang. All players simultaneously place those dudes at their home, paying all cost. Starting dudes do not generate any entering a play effects. Shuffle your deck and draw a play hand of 5 cards. If you wish to resolve a grifter ability in your starting posse, do so now. If both players have grifters, randomly determine who resolves the ability first. You are now ready to begin the game. Doomtown is played over a series of days. Each day in Doomtown moves through four phases. Gambling, upkeep, high noon, and sundown. The gambling phase determines who goes first for the day, using game of lowball poker. The upkeep phase is when you collect ghost rock for your deeds and home, and pay for your dudes upkeeps to keep them in play. The high noon phase is where most of the action will take place. Players bringing in new dudes and goods, maneuvering around town, using noon abilities, and getting into shootouts. The sundown phase is when victory is determined. If no one is won, then everyone gets to draw some new cards, unboot their dudes, and get ready for the next day. We'll look at those phases in more depth now. The gambling phase begins with each player anting one ghost rock from their stash and playing it at the center of the table. Then both players set aside their play hands and draw the top five cards from their deck to form a draw hand. Players then reveal their draw hands and the player with the lowest ranked hand wins the gambling phase. The winner takes Ghost Rock in the center of the table and adds it to their stash. That player also has the first opportunity to take actions in the high noon phase of the game. Once this is completed, the players discard their draw hands and move on to the upkeep phase. During the upkeep phase, first players collect income from their home and any deeds they own and control. Then they pay the upkeep cost of each dude they have in play. If you cannot or choose not to pay the dude's upkeep, they are discarded. Starting with the winner and going clockwise, players take turns making noon plays. When it's your turn to make a play, you can make one of the five basic plays from the rulebook. Actin', callin' out, movin', shoppin', or tradin'. Additionally, a player can pass their action. You can make these plays in any order and any number of times. Play keeps passing to the left around the table until every player passes consecutively. Once this happens, the high noon phase ends and we move to the sundown phase. Let's now take a minute to talk about those five plays in more depth. One play you may make is to use a noon ability on an action card in your play hand or print it on any of your cards in play. To do so, declare the ability, pay any costs, meet any requirements if necessary, and resolve the effect. The cost of ability includes booting the card if the ability has the word boot in front of the colon and paying any ghost rock required to use the ability. Also, if the card says something like, do X to achieve Y, X is considered a requirement. The first sentence of an ability also includes the requirements that must exist in order to use the ability. 
For example, if an ability begins with a sentence, choose an opposing dude with a weapon attached, there must be an opposing dude in play with a weapon attached. If not, you cannot use that ability. You can only use each ability on a given card in play once per day or once during setup. It's important to note that normally an ability used during setup will not be available during the first turn since the ability only refresh at the end of a turn. And because of that, the end of setup is not considered end of a turn. However, an ability that includes the words repeat before the colon can be used multiple times per day without limit. Most ability on deeds can only be used by the deeds controller, whether or not the controller is also its owner. This is noted by the word controller in front of the deeds ability. Unless otherwise noted, the effect of a noon ability lasts through the end of the sundown phase. When you make a noon play using an action card, only put the card in your discard pile once the play is complete and it is the next player's turn to make a play. You make this play to bring in a dude, deed, spell, or goods card into play from your play hand. Pay its ghost rock cost to the bank, then put the card on the table unbooted. You can start using its abilities as soon as your next turn to make a play. The way you bring a card into play depends on the card type. Dudes start your home unbooted. Deeds, unless they say otherwise, are all in town. Place a new in town deed at either end of your street at the last card in that direction. New deeds cannot be placed in between the locations on your street. Out of town deeds are never added to your street, but instead are placed off to one side. Attach good cards to one of your unbooted dudes at a location you control. That card sticks with them. A dude can usually carry any number of goods, but can only ever have one horse and one weapon at a time. After you attach a weapon or horse to a dude that already has one, you must discard the old one. There are a few good cards that attach to deeds rather than dudes, but those are clearly noted on the cards themselves. All spells have restrictions on who can attach them. Only Huxers can have Hexes, Blessed have Miracles, and Shamans have Spirits. Attach the card to one of your unbooted dudes at a location you control. That card sticks with them, and a dude can attach any number of spell cards. Some card effects let you bring another card into play. When using one of those effects, the new card enters play following the same rules depending on its type. The cost of the new card must be paid, so if you can't pay those costs, you cannot attempt to bring it into play. If that new card is a good or spell, a dude can attach it even when booted and or in a location you do not control. Dudes still can't take anything they're not allowed to carry. If you have two or more dudes you control together in a location you control, you can swap any number of good cards between them. All dudes receiving goods must be unbooted and cannot receive anything they're not allowed to carry. Booted dudes cannot give away, but can receive them. Once a dude gets a good card from a trade, that dude cannot trade it away on the same day. Dudes with weapons and horses are allowed to trade them, although, once you are done trading, if a dude has more than one of each, you must discard the extra cards. Dudes cannot trade spells. Some card effects let you transfer good cards from one dude to another. When using any of those effects, a dude can attach the good card even when booted and or at locations you do not control. Dudes still can't take anything they're not allowed to carry, and can still only ever have one weapon and one horse card attached at the end of the play. As a noon play, you can move one of your unbooted dudes to any other location in play, a deed, a home, or town square, regardless of how far that location is or whether or not it's adjacent. This movement boots a dude unless you're making one of the following two special moves. A dude can move from their home to any adjacent location without booting. Locations adjacent to your home are the town square, the deeds on either side of your home, but could include other locations as indicated by card effects. The second way is, a dude can move from town square to any adjacent location except their own home without booting. This includes all in-town deeds, other players' homes, but again, could include other locations as indicated by card effects. Although neither of these special abilities boots a dude, the dude must still be unbooted in order to perform the move. Some card effects let you move a dude. These are usually noon abilities, but there are also a few shootout and react abilities too. When using one of these effects, you can use it to move a booted dude 
and the move does not boot your dude. Card effects that move a dude must move them to a new location. The dude cannot remain at the same location unless the effect is sending them home booted. As a noon play, one of your unbooted dudes can call out a dude controlled by another player at the same location. That is, challenge that dude to a shootout. This doesn't boot your dude, and so as long as they stay unbooted, your dude can continue to call out any opposing dude at their location each and every time it's your turn to make a play. However, this play cannot be used to call out an opposing dude at the dude's home. If unbooted, the dude you call can refuse the call out by moving home booted. A booted dude must accept a call out. Some card effects let you call out a dude. When using one of these effects, your dude may call someone out even while booted, and more importantly, can use it to call out a dude in their home. If not already booted, dudes at their home can still refuse each call out by moving home booted, even though they're already there. Such a refusal still boots the dude, of course. If a dude accepts a call out, a shootout starts at that location, and both players form their posses. The fourth and final phase is Sundown. Once the High Noon phase is over, the Sundown phase immediately begins. Any traits or effects that apply continue during Sundown start. The first thing you do is check for the victory condition to see if anybody has won. If you have more control points than the highest influence among all players, you win. If two or more players meet this victory condition, the one with the most control points win. That is also tied, the player with the most influence wins. That is also tied, play another day and check again for victory. Any effects that require a check or game state change during sundown are then resolved. All players may choose to discard one card from their hand, with the winner choosing first. All players then discard down or refill their play hand to the maximum hand size of 5. Next, unboot all cards, and then turn and phase effects end in the following order. The active window for sundown effects now ends, so abilities or requirements based on sundown are no longer triggered. Effects that apply during sundown end and then effects that apply until the end of the turn end. Abilities now refresh, which means they can be used again and are ready for the next day. Finally, the day ends and a new day begins. We return back to the gambling phase. Next, let's play through a full day of Doomtown. We've already set up the board and chose our starting posses. We both put our play hands aside and ANSI one rock to the center of the table. Then we take the top five cards of our deck and reveal them to our opponent. The lowest poker hand wins, so in this example, the fourth ring's pair is lower than the Law Dog's two pair. That means they will take the Ghost Rock from the center and add it to their stash, and have the opportunity to take the first action during the noon phase. After this is done, we discard the draw hand and pick our play hands back up. During the upkeep phase, we'll gain Ghost Rock from our homes and pay the upkeeps of the dudes we have in play. Now in the high noon phase, the fourth ring player will have the first opportunity to make a play. The first thing he decides to do is take a shopping action and attach Soul Blast to Steel Archer. Now that that's resolved, the Log Dog player has an opportunity. He decides to play Circle M Ranch. The fourth ring player then plays the General Store. The Log Dog player decides to use his Outfits ability to make Travis Moon wanted. To make a character wanted, you simply take one Ghost Rock and put it on the card to represent they are wanted. The fourth ring player decides to move Steel Archer to the town square. Because he's moving from home to the town square, this action does not boot him. The Law Dog player decides to play the card Kidnapping from his hand. This card will start a job. Let's take a second to explain jobs. Jobs are the big events that happen in Doomtown. Jobs are initiated by card abilities that have text like Noon Job. The first thing you must do is choose one of your unbooted dudes to be the leader of the job. If the ability that started the job came from the text on the dude, good, or spell card, that dude, or the dude the card is attached to, must be selected the job's leader. Next, you must choose your mark. All jobs intend to do something to some place or someone. The intended target is called the mark. The first sentence of the job tells you what the mark is. The leader doesn't have to be in the same location as the mark to start the job. In fact, the leader can even be in an out-of-town location. Unlike when calling out, you can declare your own cards to be the mark of a job. 
If so, you then cannot defend against the job, although other players still can. The next thing you do is form your posse. Once the leader is chosen, it's time to form a posse. The leader forms a posse first, and a dude chosen to lead the job is automatically the first person in the posse. When a leader is forming a posse for a job, there are sometimes requirements that must be met in order to attempt the job. These requirements are treated as part of the required clause of a play. If you cannot meet those requirements, you cannot attempt the job. All dudes other than leader have to boot to join the posse unless they're already at the mark's location. Dudes at the same location as the mark can join without booting, and can even join if booted. A dude cannot join a posse if there are restrictions that prevent him from moving to that mark's location. The formation of a leader's posse follows a special routine for jobs. Note all of these steps happen sequentially and before any opposing posses are formed. First, unbooted dudes at the location of the leader can join the posse by booting. Once you've selected all those dudes, you can move on to the next step. Second, any unbooted dudes adjacent to the location of the leader may boot to join the posse. But you do not move to the location of the leader. Once you've selected all of these dudes, move to the next step. Third, all dudes currently in the leader's posse move sequentially to the location of the mark. Once your current posse is at the mark, you move to the next step. Fourth, any unbooted dudes adjacent to the location of the mark may boot to join the leader's posse and move to the location of the mark. Once you've selected all these dudes, you move to the next step. Fifth, any dudes at the location of the mark may join the leader's posse, even if booted, and do not need to boot to join the leader's posse. Once all these dudes have been selected, the leader's posse is considered to be fully formed. Once the leader has declared who's joining their posse, the mark's controller can also form a posse. The mark can only use dudes at or adjacent location to the mark's location. These dudes must boot to join the posse unless they are already at the mark's location. Dudes at the same location as the mark can join even if booted. The members of the posse are formed sequentially and follow the same rules as the leader. Note though, unlike a callout, the mark does not necessarily have to join the posse, although it's usually a good idea. Players cannot form a posse containing zero dudes. After the leader creates a posse, if the mark cannot or chooses not to create a legal posse, the job automatically succeeds. If a leader's posse and a posse to oppose the job both are at the location of the mark, a shootout starts. Shootouts occur when a dude accepts a callout or opposes a job. Both players in the shootout form a posse. The leader declares their entire posse first. In this example, the shootouts occurred from a job, but if it was a callout, joining posses would be slightly different. When a shootout occurs from a callout, Use these posse formation steps instead. First, the player who is the leader has their dude who initiated the callout join the posse automatically. Then the player who is the leader selects additional dudes to join the posse in the following manner. If a dude is unbooted and adjacent to the location of the shootout, the dude boots and joins the posse. Once the player who is the leader has completed forming the posse, the player who is the mark does the same. The dude who is the mark joins the posse first and automatically. When a shootout takes place in a private location, regardless of who started it, all dudes in the shootout that are not controlled by the owner of that location have their bounty increased by one. Each shootout is resolved in a series of rounds, done one at a time, until all dudes in one posse are shot dead or flee. The first step of this is make plays. Starting with the winner of lowball and proceeding clockwise, each player with a dude in the shootout makes a shootout play. Shootout plays include any cards or abilities that have the word shootout in front of it. In this example, the fourth ring player will choose to use the shootout ability on his spell, Soul Blast. To use a spell's ability, you must pay any cost the spell have. In this example, Soul Blast requires you to boot the spell. Next, a spell will have a difficulty number. In this example, Soul Blast has a difficulty of X, meaning that it is variable. Soul Blast tells us that X is equal to a dude's grit. A dude's grit is his value plus bullets plus influence. So in this case, Steel Archer is using Soul Blast against Travis Moon, meaning the difficulty will be 7. Once you know your difficulty, you make a pull. A pull discards the top card of your deck and compares its value to the difficulty. If the value equals or succeeds the difficulty, the spell succeeds and you resolve its effects. The other option you can do is pass. All shootout abilities only last until the end of the shootout. Once both players have passed consecutively, we move on to the next step. Next, the leader and mark, in that order, choose and announce their shooter from the dudes in their posse. Any dude can be chosen as shooter, including booted dudes. Next, we go to the draw. 
This is where we see how well your posse performs in the round of the shootout. You do this by dealing yourself a draw hand from the deck and make the best poker hand you can. Set aside your play hand. Then draw cards off the top of your deck equal to 5 plus your posse's stud bonus. Studs are any dude with a silver bullet. Your bonus is equal to the full stud rating of your shooter if they have one, plus one extra for each other stud in your posse. Even dudes that have zero bullet ratings count. Once you've drawn those cards, you can take advantage of your draw bonus. You gain a draw bonus for everyone in your posse with a draw bullet rating, which is represented by the brass bullet. Your draw bonus equals the full draw bonus of your shooter if they have one, plus one extra for each other draw in your posse. Once you've determined your draw bonus, take a look at the cards in your draw hand and decide which, if any of them, you'd like to discard, up to a number equal to your draw bonus. Discard them, and then replace them with cards drawn from the top of your deck. You must take your draw bonus all at once, not one card at a time. Once that's done, make the best 5 card poker hand you can and discard the rest of the cards. Both players reveal their draw hands and resolve any effects in cards in play that refer to the hands being revealed. Starting with the player that won lowball, and proceeding clockwise, each player with a dude in the shootout either passes or plays a resolution ability until all players pass consecutively. If due to the use of a resolution ability, one player loses all dudes in their posse, from either being ace, discarded, or sent home, the shootout immediately ends. The next step is to compare casualties. Players now compare the ranks of their respective draw hands. The rank of a draw hand is always the highest possible rank that can be achieved with the cards in that hand. The difference between the two ranks is the number of casualties the loser takes. If a hand ranks are tied, both players take one casualty. A player takes casualties by discarding or acing dudes in their posse. Discarding a dude covers one casualty while acing one covers two. Starting with the loser of the shootout, each player must ace or discard enough dudes in their posse to match their casualties. They must match the exact number of casualties of Fable. They may not voluntarily take more or less casualties than required. Once that happens, starting with the loser of the shootout round, all players decide which of their dudes flee the shootout. Those that flee leave the posse and move home booted. Even dudes that are already booted or already at home can flee the shootout. Each player decides for all of their dudes before the next player decides. Then both players discard their draw hands. If only one posse remains, that player wins the shootout. If both posses still have at least one dude each, we go back to the very first step and do another round of shootouts. Once shootouts are complete, you can check to see if the job succeeded or failed. If the leader's posse is the only one with dudes still in it, the job succeeds. If the mark is the only one with the posse still remaining, the job fails and it is discarded. All dudes in the leader's posse are then sent home booted. The fourth ring player's next play decides to pass, waiting to see what his opponent does. The law dog player also passes, meaning both have passed consecutively and the high noon phase is now over. We move to the sundown phase. We first check to see if anybody has won. Both players have one control point. The fourth ring player has one influence. That is not enough control to win for the law dog player. The law dog player has five influence to the one control point by the fourth ring player. Also not enough control to win the game. The game goes another day. Lastly, we're going to take a second to talk about starting posses. When picking your starting posse, you win a good number of characters that have enough influence so you don't lose the game on turn one. At least one stud to help your shootouts, and make sure the cost is under your starting stash rating so you have Ghost Rock to go into the next turn. Thank you for watching this video and learning how to play Doomtown Reloaded.